So then, okay, awesome. So today is our great pleasure to have Professor Andrew Young from UC Santa Barbara. Uh, so Andrew got his PhD in New York City at Columbia University, and he did his postdoc as a Papalardo fellow at MIT. And then I guess uh, he joined UC Santa Barbara back in 2015. And now he's a full professor, uh, I guess, uh, starting this past summer. So, I mean, he has done great work uh, for the last decade or so on uh, 2D materials, graphene. And he was at the beginning of all of those. Now with the recent discovery of magic angle ferromagnetism, it seems there's a zoo of things that can come out of this and they're all super exciting. Um, he has been the recipient of a Blavatnik Award uh, as a finalist, um, Presidential Early Career Award, New Horizon Prize from Breakthrough Prize Foundation, the Sloan Research Fellow, and the list goes on and on. Um, so, so we are very uh, happy uh, and, and very excited to hear Andrew's talk today. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Javad, for that nice introduction. Let me share my screen and make sure that everything is good. Are you seeing the right? Um, Presentation mode, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Like yeah. Great. So, um, yeah. So, thanks, uh, Javad, and everybody else for the opportunity to come and present um, some uh, recent work uh, from my lab. So today, I'm I'm going to focus. Uh, and I'm sorry if this isn't exactly what I wrote in the abstract, but I, I as I was making the talk, I I thought that um, I'm going to focus on novelties in the magnetism uh, that we have been able to you know, discover and in, you know, occasional uh, instances engineer in these systems. Um, and in particular, try to uh, try to tell you about uh, what we think is exciting, you know, partially from a potential technological point of view, but but more, more from a fundamental point of view of, of what kind of systems can be ferromagnets and, um, and what the implications of being able to make uh, ferromagnets with new degrees of freedom are and how uh, you know how this field is developing in terms of trying to turn those into more and more robust uh, phenomena. So um, I think I don't have to. I know there are many experts at uh, NYU in, in the you know who are interested in magnetic technology. Of course, magnets are you know very useful from electric motors to uh, computer memory. Um, and uh, a lot of this talk uh, comes from uh, looking at magnetism um, from the point of view of somebody who is. Uh, more uh, familiar with electronic technology. So in particular, field effect transistors where fundamentally most of the time one has a two-dimensional electron system and you can vary the uh, charge carrier density using the field effect. Um, and of course, for you know, for technology, that's very useful. That's what uh, uh, modern uh, I'm digital sorry, electron... Uh, oh, sorry. I guess, I don't know if it's only me, but there is some sort of vibration coming in. Uh, is it... Maybe the internet, maybe the internet connection goes in and out, but it's okay. okay. It's okay on my end, Javad. Okay, on your end. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Then maybe it's me. I'm sorry. No problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, <coughs> so there's a you know longstanding technology goal that actually you know uh, kind of went out of fashion of um, being able to do spintronics with semiconductor systems where you can actually control uh, uh, control spin effects in, um, in a low dimensional electron system. And uh, some of what I'll tell you will we'll, we'll get back to that basic idea, uh, but really coming from the point of view that there are uh, some new fundamental uh, degrees of freedom to control in the experimental systems I'll tell you about. And of course, magnetism as fundamental physics is very important. It's both you know, a, an intrinsically interacting and quantum mechanical effect and um, magnetic models in general are the building blocks for how we understand many exotic phases of matter, the Hubbard model being sort of the primary, um, the, the primary example of that uh, and, and it's many exotic phases. So, um, so let me give a brief history of the you know, 2,500 year um, history of, of, of ferromagnetism. So as far as I know, uh, based on, you know, reading Wikipedia, uh, the earliest um, discovery of magnetism dates to like the, you know, fifth and sixth century uh, BC by Thales of Miletus. Of course, no, none of his writing survived. So this is all written, you know, long afterwards. Uh, and he was said to have noted the attraction of iron by magnetite. And actually he concluded from that, that matter is alive. Um, so, in some sense, you know, our, our theories of magnetism have improved since then. Um, and, you know, a notable 
uh, a notable example is uh, Niels Bohr's PhD thesis actually uh, proved that classically the free energy is independent of the vector potential. So you cannot have any spontaneous magnetization. Um, there's no classical magnetism absent quantum mechanics. Um, but in other ways, our, uh, you know, our knowledge of magnetism has not improved very much in the sense that throughout that 2,500 year period, more or less every ferromagnet we know of is basically similar to magnetite in the sense that it comes from the spontaneous alignment of the electron spin degree of freedom. So, um, so how does that work in, at a very basic level, right? Uh, quantum, you know, <coughs> mag ferromagnetism comes from the uh, combination of repulsive Coulomb interactions. So the desire of electrons in a crystal or in any, you know, any condensed matter system to stay, you know, charges to stay far from each other and Fermi statistics, which prevent them from uh, occupying the same state. So you can, um, you can see this in a very simple example, uh, which you can find as a problem in landau lifshitz quantum mechanics of two finite square wells. And you can consider um, the uh, states in the individual square wells and notice that uh, one can make um, either symmetric or anti-symmetric combinations of these orbitals. And if you do this problem in landau lifshitz quantum mechanics, uh, what, uh, what you're asked to do is calculate the energy difference between these two, given the fact that um, the uh, electrons repel each other by the Coulomb, Coulomb repulsion. And if you do the resulting integral, you'll find that um, <coughs> in this problem, there is indeed an energy splitting between these symmetric and anti-symmetric orbital states. And that energy uh, splitting will favor uh, the anti-symmetric orbital state. Now, Fermi statistics tell us that uh, that electrons, uh, their overall wave function must be anti-symmetric, which implies that their spin wave function must be symmetric if, they're anti if their uh, orbital wave function is anti-symmetric. So that's the basic origin of, um, of ferromagnetism is that this orbital interaction, this Coulomb repulsion and Fermi statistics uh, favor, uh, 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 think about this in a con condensed matter system through uh, an effective model where you can take this J as essentially favoring spins to be aligned. And this model has a phase transition in three dimensions and it has an ordered state uh, at low temperatures, which is simply all of the spins being aligned with each other. It has a large magnetic moment. It spontaneously breaks time reversal symmetry because all the spins align. And that's basically what we usually mean when we say a, uh, a ferromagnet will be in some way related uh, uh, to this picture. Um, now in two dimensional, systems, it's a little bit more complicated, and I'll tell you a little bit about two dimensional, uh, mostly about two-dimensional systems today. In principle, there's no long-range order for that Hamiltonian in, uh, in two dimensions, so you need some anisotropy. Um, uh, once you have some anisotropy, which is usually provided by the spin-orbit interaction, then, uh, then this becomes um, a 2D icing model, and that 2D icing model, of course, also has a phase transition and an ordered state uh, at low temperatures. Now, um, uh, this is a relative, you know, spin orbit coupling, although it's something that's, you know, ubiquitous and leads to many interesting effects in condensed matter physics, is still a relativistic correction to atomic structure. And it's intrinsically relatively weak. You can make it stronger by going to atoms with very large Z. And that's why most magnets have relatively heavy elements in them that helps um, you want to have localized orbitals to give you sort of a, that, uh, that strong exchange interaction and so on. So those are the basic descriptions of most magnets. Of course, you know, condensed matter is a zoo. There's many different examples and, and counterexamples of one thing or another. But for the most part, most magnetic ferromagnetic systems are have relatively heavy elements. They have relatively low, a local, a, a band of, of electrons that are relatively localized so that in some way they emulate that, um, uh, that uh, finite square well uh, type of potential and they have strong spin orbit coupling. So from that point, you grab Graphene is an extremely unlikely candidate to make ferromagnetic uh, spintronic devices out of because it has none of these features. So it's certainly very two dimensional. So you certainly need some way to generate anisotropy. At the same time, there's absolutely no spin orbit coupling. I don't mean absolutely no spin orbit coupling. Of course, there's some amount of finite spin orbit coupling, but, uh, but it's one of the lightest elements. Carbon is a very light element that, that's, and that spin orbit coupling goes with some power of uh, of, of Z, uh, the atomic number. And in graphene, that's thought to be on the microvolt 
uh, scale are smaller. So spin orbit coupling is, for all intents and purposes, completely absent in this system. And moreover, the, the uh, native uh, wave functions in monolayer graphene are extremely delocalized. They're you know, very fast carriers. They um, are described by this now famous massless Dirac equation, and they are you know, among the, in some ways, the most delocalized carriers you could find in a material. So, um, so this talk is mostly about magnet ferromagnetism and graphene. One clearly has to do something here, right? Now, the key ingredient is actually already provided, which is the fact that you know, absent spin orbit coupling, the idea of spin ferromagnetism is, is essentially in some ways a non starter that's unlikely to actually uh, to actually work very well but graphene naturally provides you with a totally different degree of freedom that comes from orbital um, its orbital structure so what's drawn on the upper right here is the band structure of graphene expanded about the charge neutral point for a pristine graphene crystal and um, it's drawn in momentum space so these represent the corners of the Brillouin zone and this color coding indicates that there are actually two inequivalent corners of the Brillouin zone. So there's a degree of freedom that parameterizes whether one is at the K or K prime valley, known as the valley, because these look like valleys. Um, and they're distinct, and it's an extra degree of freedom. So that enable <coughs> all of the physics that, uh, that I'll tell you about today, because that is a degree of freedom that is coming from the orbital motion of the electrons in the graphene at the lattice scale. It's a distinction at the lattice scale, which you can understand by thinking about the fact that this is the full Brillouin zone. So your uh, the difference between electrons at one corner and the other is essentially encoded in the relative phase of the wave functions on the two uh, atoms within this bipartite um, lattice. But that gives you another way to make a microscopic angular momentum, if you'd like. Uh, it's a microscopic orbital degree of freedom that can give you some finite angular momentum for appropriately chosen uh, combinations. And in particular, it's highly anisotropic because at the end of the day, it comes from the orbitals of this graphene and those are confined to a perfectly two-dimensional plane. So it generates something that essentially will look like a spin graphene lattice, they are much larger than uh, the um, size of, uh, of this graphene lattice. An individual electron you know, wave packet will, will encompass many, uh, many such lattice sites at the densities that we're, that we're going to be in, interested in. By the way, I forgot to say, please feel free to interrupt me with questions. I would greatly welcome it. I think we've all been in the era of Zoom for a long time, and we know uh, that you know, yelling at a computer screen by yourself is much less fun than you know yelling at somebody through a computer screen. So, um, so anyway, just please interrupt me. Don't raise your hand. Just just shout uh, if there's if there's something that's unclear or you just like more detail. So uh, okay, so so let me tell you how to turn. Uh, you know, how do you take this very itinerant system and turn it magnetic? I'll give you an example um, from our recent work on intrinsic magnetism just in graphene and graphite in general, um, and then tell you about how to control this by twist angle engineering. And then I'll describe, I'll sort of give you a bit of a list of um, some findings and interesting uh, phenomena that we've observed and, and, and talk about you know, where we're trying to go in terms of improving these systems and making them more robust and, and, and uh, give a little sense of the material science um, uh, behind our efforts. Okay, so if you want to, you know, the, the one way to think about magnetism is that um, if you have a band of electrons, as occurs in a solid, then uh, there is a tension between polarizing those electrons and um, uh, therefore minimizing your exchange energies, right, which would like the, those electrons to actually have a symmetric spin wave function. This will cost you kinetic energy because uh, if you only fill one spin, or for that matter, any other microscopic degree of freedom, it means that you will have to fill more states uh, within your band. And so there's this trade-off between um, the kinetic energy, which is parameterized by this band with gamma, and uh, the um, exchange interaction, which would like you to half fill this, you know, to fill this band 
a, you know, let's say it's a spin degenerate band, you'd like to fill the whole thing that'll cost you essentially something aboard of the bandwidth. And this is captured by the stoner criterion. Uh, the stoner criterion basically says that, uh, you know, when this bandwidth is uh, smaller than the strength of that exchange coupling, um, then uh, you will get ferromagnetism because you can gain more energy by occupying, let's say this, and let's say this band is half filled, you could occupy the, every state in the band with one spin projection, that'll be a lower energy state than half filling it with, uh, with equal and opposite um, populations of, let's say, the two spins or two valleys in our case. So it, this is crude, it misses a lot of detail, but <coughs> as a basic point of view, um, it, uh, it captures the tension uh, between kinetic energy and potential energy uh, from Coulomb interactions. And of course, you know, it again makes graphene look uh, it's a way of restating the statement about localized electrons, but it, it makes, uh, it, it again, graphene doesn't look very good because graphene has a very low density of states. Okay, and moreover, this exchange interaction cannot be fundamentally all that strong because it depends on how close the electrons are. And the regimes that we're going to be discussing are all very low electron density. So there's, very, there's not much overlap between the charges. Okay, so, so we're in this troubling situation where, you know, I'm supposed to give a talk about magnetism, but, um, but graphene has almost no, uh, has vanishing density of states near charge neutrality and um, no seeming prospect for magnetism. So the key to everything I'll tell you about is the fact that um, interlayer coupling in graphite of all kinds, more or less can always generate the high density of states. And as a result, effectively small, you know, small bandwidth that is necessary to make Coulomb interactions relevant and in particular exchange interactions and lead to a variety of symmetry breaking uh, phenomena, including uh, magnetism. So this is seen already in the simplest thing that you can make beyond monolayer graphene, which is simply bilayer graphene. Bilayer graphene as extracted from the graphite in your pencil, nothing, uh, nothing unusual. And you can see uh, from these pictures of band structure that the linearly dispersing bands with vanishing density of states at charge neutrality, the density of states goes like square root of the charge carrier density. When you have regular Bernal bilayer graphene, this interlayer hopping is enough to convert those into um, uh, parabolically dispersing bands at low density. And those parabolically dispersing bands now at least have a constant density of states in two dimensions as you approach uh, as you approach this point. So you've already made some progress in terms of increasing density of states and giving yourself a hope of, uh, of meeting the stoner criterion. And the stoner criterion is actually not specific to magnetism. You can more or less think about it as simply uh, a rough estimate for when do repulsive Coulomb interactions become important relative to kinetic energy. And when repulsive Coulomb interactions are unimportant, you have band theory, you have more or less physics, you know, as it's taught, you know, to maybe first year graduate students, the first pages of Ashcroft and Merman. And once those Coulomb interactions become important, then all hell breaks loose and there are many different, uh, uh, many different things that can happen. It also becomes theoretically much more difficult to predict what will happen because you are faced with uh, the many body problem. Um, uh, and it is uh, computationally uh, always uh, requires some approximations, which essentially bake in the answer you're gonna get most of the time. So, um, so fine, so we've made some progress. It's still not a very high density of states. If you plug the numbers, it doesn't really work. But things get interesting uh, when you start to use the fact that uh, when you have a two-dimensional system, you can tune it using electric field. So of course, if you make it one plate of a capacitor, you can change its charge carry density and we'll make, uh, we'll make use of that. But if you make it one plate of a three-plate capacitor where it's in the middle, you can not only control the charge carry density, but also control the electric field, the perpendicular displacement field, which will try force electrons to be polarized more on one layer or another. And under that condition where you introduce essentially an asymmetry between the two layers of the bilayer, something very interesting happens because you had this unusual situation of a parabolic band touching, which is actually rather unnatural. Uh, linear, you know, most band touchings are linear and, and in bilayer graphene at some microscopic level, it's linear, but it's approximately a parabolic band touching. And when you gap that out, you get a semiconductor with bands that actually have a quartic dispersion. So the energy goes like the fourth power of the momentum approximately. And under that circumstance, actually at the band edge, so right at when you add the first electrons or first holes into bilayer graphene, the density of states actually diverges like one over the density. So you automatically generate this very high density of states um, 
uh, at the band edge. It's very different from a conventional semiconductor. And there's an intrinsic reason for that. And it's, it's driven by essentially, you know, the interplay of interlayer hopping and, um, <coughs> and electric fields. And actually, this is a general trend. This is something that's relatively ubiquitous, these types of Van Hove singularities. So um, there's a special type of graphite where it simply gets better and better. So uh, for rhombohedral graphite, which is not exactly the ground state, most graphite stacking goes A, B, A, B, where A and B denote the different, uh, there's, there's three different ways you can put two graphite planes on top of each other with one of the atoms in the middle of a hexagon on the other atom and the other atom on top of another atom. So there's three ways to do that. The, you know, most graphite is A, B, A, B, but it can all, it's almost as low energy to make it A, B, C, which is called rhombohedral graphite. And rhombohedral graphite basically just continues this trend. The density of states, uh, the divergence in the density of states actually just gets stronger as you, um, as you increase the number of layers. So for example, for rhombohedral trilayer graphene, again, in a very, for the experts, this is in a very simplified model, but the, the rough trend uh, is correct, will now go like one over n squared as you reach the band, as you reach the band edge. And this Van Hove singularity just gets stronger. Okay, so there's a price to pay there because rhombohedral graphite is, is only metastable rather than absolutely mechanically stable, but, um, but it turns out it's something that you can do. So, so these are, uh, you know, this presents an obvious direction to go to try and make graphene magnetic and see if one can make, uh, um, uh, one can study that type of interaction physics in, in, a, in a clean system. The way that we make these devices, I'm sure you have all seen this in, in some form or another, but I'll just, I'll just show it. Um, is that uh, there's now a very well-developed technology for, um, for taking more or less any 2D material and stacking it on top of another 2D material and isolating individual atomic sheets and combining them more or less at will. So uh, this usually works by some kind of polymer film. Uh, of course, this is all the you know, trade secrets go into exactly how you make this film and how you make uh, these uh, cushions and what substrates you use and so on. But, um, but there are many ways to do this and, and they all look rather similar where one can pick up uh, these individual 2D layers. Here's what it looks like. Here's a boron nitride flake, which is our you know, essentially insulating substrate of choice and pop it off of uh, a substrate onto which it's been exfoliated. And then you can stack these up more or less as much as you'd like. And uh, this is what the devices look like. This was a particularly complicated one that had, you know, 12 or 13 uh, layers. But what's remarkable is that within these um, <coughs> these devices, which, you know, for graphene and boron nitride and more or less everything I'll show you, except at the very end, are made in air with very little attention paid to, um, uh, uh, to the environment um, uh, in which they're made, you can generate two-dimensional electron systems that are essentially pristine. Um, and this is evidenced by, you know, comparing some known physics, in particular, the physics of the fractional quantum Hall effect, which is very, you know, is kind of the, the prototypical flat band physics. So when you turn on a large magnetic field on a two-dimensional electron system, the, the quantum mechanical spectrum is given by these Landau levels, they're discrete levels that have many states within them, so very high degeneracy. And partial filling of that band leads to a whole slew of different um, different ground states that depend on exactly how many electrons you're trying to uh, populate into this flat band. There's effectively no bandwidth intrinsically. All of the bandwidth is given by uh, disorder, which makes different cyclotron orbits within the two-dimensional electron system have slightly different energies. And, um, uh, and this is relatively well understood physics, even though it's extremely exotic. And what we find is that in, in, in systems made this way, you have a, just a zoo of every fract, you know, every phenomenon that was ever seen in the cleanest three, five semiconductor quantum wells, more or less is, uh, is reproduced often more robustly in, um, uh, in these uh, graphene systems. So what I'm showing you here is a preview I'll, I'll, I'll talk about on the next slide, but we can do, for example, a capacitance measurement where we probe whether the system is compressible or incompressible. Essentially, it means whether the spectrum has a gap at the Fermi level or does not have a gap at the Fermi level. And each of these vertical lines is essentially a spontaneous order of the system in which the elementary charge carriers may have, you know, a third of an electron charge or a fifth or a seventh or a ninth or a thirteenth or, or a quarter. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, a, there's again, a, a huge literature, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. And if you're not, it's not important for this talk. Um, 
understanding the energetics of these systems and and uh, and why this happens. And essentially, it's it's telling us that the these systems are are nearly free of disorder for all intents and purposes, um, even though they're made in this very simple way. Um, so the first system I'll tell you about is is precisely this uh, rhombohedral trilayer graphene, right? Um, you know, it 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 turns out it's possible to make also metastable structures by being very careful about strain. I'll leave some of these details um, to the interested reader. You can you can have a look at these papers. And then the the first measurements I'll show you are capacitance measurements. So what we're doing is we we make these heterostructures out of graphite, and in this case bilayer graphene, or or as I'll show you, uh, rhombohedral trilayer graphene as our active layer. And then we measure the penetration of the electric field from one graphite layer to the other. And if you think about this capacitor, if the bilayer graphene is a perfect metal, then no electric field will penetrate and this capacitance should be zero. If the bilayer graphene were simply absent, then all of the electric field will pe penetrate and you'll get some, some maximum. So this gives you a way of ascertaining whether the uh, bilayer graphene is good at screening those electric fields or not good at screening those electric fields. In other words, is it compressible electrically or incompressible? And um, that uh, measure of this inverse compressibility is what we extract from, uh, from these. So back to our, our quantum hall example, these bright orange or black features are where the system has a gap and it's not compressible. And bright blue is where it's highly compressible, so it's effectively metallic. Okay, so let me show you um, <coughs> uh, uh, what things look like when we look at this rhombohedral trilayer graphene at low charge carrier density. So I'm presenting again this inverse compressibility where yellow on the scale is where it is incompressible. And so you can see that generally only at charge neutrality where one expects there to be an energy gap uh, when we apply a large electric field is it incompressible and everywhere else it's compressible or actually has negative compressibility, okay? And, uh, and I'll get back to that in a second. So, so what we're, just to be clear, what we're doing is we're using our top and bottom gates to control the charge carry density through their sum effectively and the electric field applied across the layers through their difference. And we're probing the, the inverse compressibility over the whole range of, uh, of charge carrier densities and um, electrical displacement fields. So one of these just simply fills the system with electrons, this x-axis, whereas the y-axis actually deforms the band. So here you can see the difference, this is in a more detailed band structure model, between having no applied electric field and having a large applied electric field, and it simply changes the band structure at low density, and it, it, it drives you from being essentially a semi-metal to a semiconductor with a very flat uh, dispersion at, uh, at low densities. So in particular, we expect that these this is here now plotting density of states, which is the key thing, right? Density of states has to be higher than um, uh, than the you know inverse uh, um, <coughs> of uh, exchange uh, interaction strength in order to give you correlated physics, and you can see the density of states is indeed divergent at these band edges uh, as you make this electric field larger. And indeed, in the experimental data. What you see is that as you increase the displacement field from zero to a finite value, a whole zoo of features emerges, right? And, and, and I'll walk you through a couple of these and give you a sense of, of what's going on. The basic claim is that everything that is happening here is a magnetic transition of one kind or another. And in particular, I'll draw your attention to these bright blue streaks and just tell you what they are. Those are negative compressibility. So, uh, so that's basically where this capacitance is apparently negative. Um, and that's something that in this type of geometry is associated with first order phase transitions where the system actually breaks up into inhomogeneous domains of different types of phases. This compressibility is not truly a capacitance in the sense of it being an eigenvalue of the capacitance matrix. Uh, if you think about your elementary ENM, rather it's an element of the capacitance matrix and it represents in some way the capacitance of the system relative to having a uniform sheet of charge. And so it indeed can be negative and it's not a sign of thermodynamic instability. Um, and, and just from, from years of experience and many other uh, things that I'll show you, uh, we know these bright blue features to be essentially signs of first order phase transitions um, uh, in the system. Okay, so to understand what's going on, we can you know, use all of the many techniques of uh, condensed matter physics to try and understand what the electronic structure of the system is. So in particular, one thing that one can do is look at quantum oscillations. So quantum oscillations are 
oscillations in the resistivity or magnetization or any number of other uh, properties of a material that occur when a perpendicular electric a magnetic field is applied. And what happens is that the charge carriers undergo uh, uh, cyclotron motion and there's a quantum interference effect which uh, will generate an oscillating, in our case, we measure the resistivity. Now, what, what matters for the purposes of understanding uh, the physics here is that um, the period of those oscillations in appropriate units is a measure of the area of the Fermi surface in momentum space. And so, um, and this is, you know, has a long history in condensed matter physics since the 1930s, it's been used to essentially map the Fermi surface of you know, metals, uh, again, going back to basically de Haas and, uh, and collaborators uh, pioneered this uh, almost 100 years ago. Um, we are going to, I'll just show you, you know, what we can learn from this. If you look at uh, this, the frequency of these quantum oscillations, um, we are going to look at the frequency in units corresponding to the area of the Fermi surface, but normalized to the Luttinger volume, so-called, which is the total area of momentum space that must be occupied by electrons, given that you know what the charge carrier density is, let's say from just a capacitive, uh, you know, a capacitor model. And what we find is, is kind of amazing, which is that um, these blue uh, features, which I claim correspond to first order phase transitions, actually uh, uh, demarcate boundaries between where these quantum oscillations change completely. And in particular, if you go to the highest densities, what you find is that the quantum oscillations correspond to an orbit of a Fermi surface that occupies exactly a quarter of the Luttinger volume, which is exactly what you expect if you had four species of carriers, each of which is occupying a quarter. So let's say you have spin and valley, then you have really four types of carriers. You can imagine just, you know, there's two different spin projections and there's two different valley projections. So there's four types of carriers you can have. There's four flavors of fermion in the system and they each have a Fermi surface and those Fermi surfaces are all the same. So every quantum oscillation corresponds to an orbit of a Fermi surface with a quarter of the total volume, the total area of momentum space. Then you cross a phase transition and you find that there's a sudden transition to where they each orbit a half of the Luttinger volume and then another phase transition where they each occupy a quarter of the, uh, the entire Luttinger volume, right? In other words, there are phase transitions where you're losing that degeneracy. You go from having spin and valley degeneracy to only one to neither, where finally you simply have a single Fermi surface that must be polarized within the spin and valley space. And actually we can constrain that, you know, more or less entirely, right? So we, so we call this a half metal because it's simply half of the normal degeneracy and a quarter metal where we've gotten rid of um, the spin and valley degeneracy. And we can constrain what's going on using, for example, the fact that we have a perfectly two-dimensional system and we can control the Zeeman energy by applying a magnetic field in the plane. We can find that the quarter metal phase and the half metal phase, do, you know, that phase boundary does not move within plane magnetic field. So that suggests they have the same spin polarization, but the phase boundary between the half metal and the symmetric metal does move and is cusped, which suggests that these are both spin polarized. And this one is of course symmetric and not spin polarized. And then we can do the same for the valley degree of freedom. So in particular, um, it's, you know, it's actually a relatively recent development in condensed matter physics that one uh, can generate, you know, we, we learn uh, um, as undergrads that uh, a magnetic field can generate a Hall effect, but there's an effect in uh, band theory that uh, was not discovered, you know, until long after band theory was, was, uh, was developed that, uh, the way that um, block electrons uh, uh, wave packets are constructed actually leaves room for uh, a Hull effect coming merely from the shape of those orbitals, which is which is called the Berry curvature or Berry flux. And of course, you know, this Berry flux omega corresponds effectively to a magnetic field in momentum space that can generate a Hull effect. Of course, typically it, it, it vanishes when you have time reversal symmetry. You know, you can't have a Hull effect. In a, in, a, in a system and have time reversal symmetry. So you need to break time reversal symmetry, but, um, but for an, an individual band, uh, band wave function can certainly have an anomalous Hall effect. What will typically happen is that it's time reversed, partner is also occupied in a solid, so there will be no spontaneous Hall effect. But, um, but in fact, uh, once you know, one uh, has magnetism, it's very easy to have a Hall effect by this mechanism, an anomalous Hall effect by this mechanism. And in these graphene systems, because of the absence of spin-orbit coupling, that's 
precisely tied to whether one is valley polarized. So as long as you are valley unpolarized, then wave functions in one valley and the other valley must have equal and opposite uh, contributions to this uh, Berry flux and therefore anomalous Hall effect. And um, uh, and what we find is that in this you know quarter metal phase, we indeed have spontaneous condensation of all of our electrons into one valley and as a result, an anomalous Hall effect in addition to um, presumably a spontaneous, uh, maybe a spontaneous spin magnetization. It's actually, actually not obvious. Um, so, so we can construct in this you know, very simple uh, situation, um, just a, a rough model for what our ground states look like. There's a symmetric metal here. I'm just showing the occupation of the four different flavors. One is not sure entirely which flavors they are, but um, in this case, they would all be equally occupied and you're Fermi surfaces in the different valleys, which are rotated um, with respect to each other, um, will be uh, uh, will be equally occupied. Then there's a quarter metal that is apparently spin polarized, but valley unpolarized. And finally, uh, sorry, a half metal, and then a quarter metal that's fully spin and valley polarized. So this is relatively simple. It's relatively in line with um, what can that one can then model at least phenomenologically. Um, let me show you just experimentally some facts about the system that, that I'll come back to later to try and, 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 um, and compare. There are, you know, one can certainly see, you know, the signatures of a first order transition as a function of magnetic field. So here's a sort of typical magnetic hysteresis loop that one can measure. And you see that it looks like a very clean system. You see a single domain that flips. Uh, and this is a system that's many microns in size, and it seems to flip as a single domain. And actually something that, that is much is rarer, or at least it's not unprecedented, but it's rare, is that you also have hysteretic switching um, as a function of electric fields between a magnetic state and a non-magnetic state. Um, and that's something that, again, has been seen in other systems, but is suggestive of, uh, <coughs> um, of a clean system where there are not many intermediate uh, phases to uh, um, that, that this barrier must be relatively high as would uh, be true if you have a macroscopically uh, uniform system. There aren't many small um, domains that can, that can flip. We don't see, for example, any Barkhausen noise in, uh, uh, in this type of system. Okay, so that constitutes sort of the simple introduction uh, and now things get in some ways more complicated. Um, so uh, as many of you know, you know th what I told you about actually, it's, in some ways it's an older idea but it, um, it didn't really start to come to fruition in terms of being able to observe ferromagnetism in these very simple graphene systems until just the last year or two. Um, a few years ago, a different avenue was explored, uh, began to be explored, which is to try and engineer high density of states, not by the, uh, what I told you, but rather by controlling the stacking order uh, through twist angle variation. Okay, so um, twisted bilayer graphene was the first uh, system where this really um, where this really took off. Uh, what you can see is uh, here is just a representation of two graphene layers, and this is true of any two crystals. You know, if you rotate them slightly, you generate uh, this moiré pattern. And um, there was uh, theoretical modeling that had been done that just suggested that for particular choices of this twist angle. Uh, the band structure could become rather unusual and that there would be a band near low energy. This is a plot of density of states, uh, a band near low energy with very high density of states. So again, you know, the right, um, the right uh, ingredients to generate strongly correlated physics where that bandwidth essentially vanishes. And therefore, even though Coulomb interactions, which are fundamentally given by the density of electrons are not getting any stronger, you may see correlation physics. Um, now, the key difference between Moiré systems and the itinerant systems that I have told you about so far really comes from the fact that this band is now isolated and there's a new length scale in the problem, which is this super lattice potential. And in particular, there's a emergent, you know, periodicity, which is much smaller than the period, or rather much larger than the periodicity of the, uh, of the underlying graphene crystals. And that turns out to be very important because fundamentally, you know, there, you know, in a crystalline system, you cannot get an insulating state uh, except at rational values of the electrons per unit cell. And uh, typically, the bigger your 
uh, denominator, the smaller those energy gaps will be. Um, in a crystal like graphene, you know, to fill an entire band is 10 to the 15 electrons, and you're never going to be at very low denominator rational filling of, of that lattice without um, uh, uh, with the field effect. But once you introduce this large length scale, it becomes very easy to fully fill one of the energy bands that emerges in the super lattice, which is large. And I think this is really key thing is that this super lattice compared, for example, to super lattices that one can make um, by lithographic techniques is on a is on a on a relatively small scale and can be and it's an important caveat can be is not always but can be quite uniform, um, which which gives you access to you know lo lots of physics. It can also be very strong. Okay, so uh, making twisted bilayer graphene is actually also relatively easy. Uh, you can use the same sort of tricks. So uh, really, this was pioneered actually by Emmanuel Tutuk's group. Um, uh, and uh, what you can do is, if you have a graphene sheet using these same techniques, you can pick up half of the graphene sheet. And now you have two graphene sheets, one on the substrate and one not on the substrate, whose rotational angle you know because they were taken from the same graphene sheet. And now you can rotate that substrate a little bit and control that angle and pick up the second one. And now you can make uh, uh, controlled angles. Um, and so uh, evidence for this isolated moiré band, uh, you know, first emerged around 2017, where here you can see at one degree, there's a, um, an insul you know, a relatively insulating state at uh, a charge carrier density that corresponds exactly to four electrons and four holes per moiré unit cell. And that's tuned by the angle, but it's, it's, it's strongest at one degree. And, you know, to took kind of missed the boat, unfortunately, because uh, he got went to one degree. And then if you look at 1.1 degree, a lot of more interesting stuff happens because that's where the band gets particularly flat. And um, once that you have that flatness, the first indication that something really interesting is going on is that you start to see uh, evidence of correlated physics in the form in particular of uh, insulators at half of that filling. So at two electrons or two holes per unit cell. And absent electron-electron interactions, because you have the spin and valley degeneracy in graphene, the, the band theory gaps are at four electrons or four holes per unit cell. At two electrons or two holes, you have to have broken some kind of symmetry. <coughs> so that's, you know, that's sort of exciting thing number one. So, um, so now I want to just take that knowledge, right, the fact that apparently one can break symmetries and open up gaps at integer filling that are actually insulating states and ask how does that play with the observation that I've told you about in conventional graphene that you can you know exchange interactions will drive you to spontaneously condense in momentum space for example into one of the valleys and generate an anomalous hall effect and it turns out that 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 those two play together in a very important way because um, this anomalous hall effect is interesting in metals and it's useful in metals, but in insulators, it's in some ways rather spectacular. And indeed, you know, it, it's what what really j led to the discovery already 40 years ago of topological phenomena in condensed matter physics. So specifically, there is a, a theorem proven by you know Thales and collaborators in 1982 that says that if you look at this anomalous Hall effect in a fully filled band. So within a gap, it's quantized, right? And it's quantized um, based on a topological invariant of that band structure. So specifically, you know, you take that Barry flux and you integrate it over your fully filled band, and they showed that it's going to be the uh, sum of the so-called churn number of all of the occupied bands. Now we know from already these bilayer experiments and and from you know a whole host of theoretical and experimental. Uh, literature on graphene that that these gapped Dirac points taking graphene and opening up a gap you will generally ger generate lots of Barry curvature and as a result lots of Barry flux and it turns out that in twisted bilayer graphene for example the moiré bands have finite churn numbers then that's very easy to get them to have finite churn numbers um, there's some details that I'll leave out, but I'm happy to discuss with the experts as far as you know exactly how one must construct these samples for that to be true but it is uh, uh, it is not hard to generate a finite churn number in these super lattice bands. Um, and now we know that there are strong enough interactions in a flat enough band that may lead you to fully occupy some of these bands and not others. And that allows you to get around the 
you know, the, the, the fundamental issue, which is that the, the, band, the bands may have finite churn number, but on net between, for example, both the valleys, in the same way that the anomalous Hall effect has to cancel between the two valleys, the quantized anomalous Hall effect must cancel between the two valleys. So you need some way to spontaneously break time reversal symmetry and specifically to put all your electrons in one valley in order to, um, uh, in order to uh, generate uh, a quantized Hall effect. And the key thing is, as that happens spontaneously, then you'll get a quantized Hall effect at zero magnetic field. Um, I wish I could say that, you know, we thought about this really carefully and, uh, you know, then engineered our sample just the right way. That's not really how uh, any of this moiré field works. Mostly it's a little bit more of a statistical approach experimentally uh, for reasons that, that I'll get back to where one is going to make a lot of samples and have a look and see what happens. But, um, but uh, it turns out that, uh, you know, if I was to tell the story a little dishonestly, I would say, well, it turns out what you need is graphene at just the right angle. You also need it to be then rotationally aligned to the underlying boron nitride substrates for a reason that I won't get into. And then, you know, of course, it will spontaneously valley polarize and, um, uh, uh, and give you a quantized Hall effect. But that's not, of course, how the experiment was actually done, but that is indeed what happened. So, uh, so studying a particular sample, um, we found that at three electrons per unit cell, for reasons that, again, are highly detail dependent, one simply has a quantized Hall effect at zero magnetic field because there is spontaneous ferromagnetism in the, of the exact same type as gave us ferromagnetism in, uh, in, in regular bilayer and trilayer graphene. However, because of this moiré, it becomes favorable to fill an integer number of bands in a single valley and a different integer number in the other valley, which leaves you with a net occupied band in one of the valleys, which has a net, which has a finite churn number. You know, they would have churn numbers one and minus one in the two valleys, but if you only fill one of them, you get one. And indeed, one finds that at zero magnetic field, there is a finite Hall effect that's precisely quantized to the resistance quantum and a vanishing longitudinal resistance, right? And this is exactly the phenomenology of the quantum Hall effect, right? Where one has chiral edge states which propagate around the boundary of the sample and they only go um, into uh, uh, one of the two um, uh, and, and there's no dissipation along the edge. I realize I'm, I'm running maybe lower on time than I thought I was going to be. Uh, Javad, how much time do I have? Um, if we can, I mean, with questions, I guess 10 minutes or so. Or... 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fine. So I'll, I'll, I'll go a little quickly. That's actually not bad, right? So, um, so, so this was a known, you know, desirable thing. It actually had been seen in, um, uh, well, why is it desirable, right? Why is a quantum Hall effect at zero magnetic field desirable? Quantum Hall effect is a beautiful effect, uh, but it's a high magnetic field effect. It's a low temperature effect. This is because, you know, fundamentally all of the energy scales of the quantum Hall effect usually come from the finite magnetic field. And, and large magnetic fields are expensive, right? Uh, the cost of a magnet really scales unfavorably with, uh, uh, with the uh, maximum magnetic field. On the other hand, magnetism is a room temperature effect, right? There are lots of room temperature magnets. You know, we all have them on our refrigerator. So this idea that you might be able to use magnetism to induce this type of uh, physics would really be sort of transformational, um, you know, not just for, you know, the application of the quantum Hall effect now is resistance metrology, which is good, but one can start to imagine things that are more fanciful. Resist, you know, dissipationless interconnect, you know, for those who are interested in, you know, superconducting qubits, you know, compact microwave circulators, maybe topological qubits made out of these edge states. All of that would be a lot easier if you simply had materials that realize this ideally at high temperature. Um, previously, the way this was done was simply by magnetically doping the right type of material. It's a completely different uh, scenario than ours, but it was realized in, in, in magnetically doped, you know, strong spin orbit uh, thin films. Um, here, what is actually happening seems to just be a purely intrinsic effect that in principle can happen in the clean limit. Um, so since I'm short on time, what I, what I want to do is just show you one cool thing that can happen based on the fact that we are actually working fundamentally with orbital wave functions and orbital magnetic moments, and then show you just briefly a tour of disorder in these systems and how we're trying to resolve that. And then, then I think I can stop there and that shouldn't take more than five or six more minutes. So, um, so the key point about these systems that differ is that rather than having you know, a large concentration of 
magnetic dopants, chromium or iron is what was used in these, in these magnetic structures that have a very large magnetic moment in and of themselves. And then on which the band wave functions sort of sit in some way, right? And they inherit a little bit of that magnetism from, from these dopants. Here, all of the moments are coming from the same band wave functions. Right? And there's a very beautiful effect that that uh, that that can occur because these band wave functions, of course, are you know very dependent on charge carrier density. Which ones are occupied will change, and therefore their magnetic moment can change. And actually, a remarkable thing happens that they can actually change sign. So I'll show you that you know this is a slightly different system. It doesn't really matter the details. It happens to be twisted monolayer bilayer graphene reasons not too important here. And it's another system that supports a quantized anomalous Hall effect at some integer filling of these super lattice unit cells. But there was a strange effect that we observed, which is that as we change charge carrier density and magnetic field, actually, when I first saw this data, I thought there's something, there's a loose cable, you know, why is it switching up and down? The Hall effect is changing sign as a function of magnetic field, but it's also changes sign as a function of electric, you know, as a function of charge carrier density. I really thought that it was just a broken, a broken experiment, right? But it turns out it's not a broken experiment. It's a, uh, it's it's something really surprising, which is that um, if you you know as as my former postdoc Gregory Polshin you know tenaciously went after um, he he was able to show that uh, actually it's not it's not a spurious effect at all. Rather, it's that the magnetization can be tuned by the density, and in in a way that that I think is is rather new. So so the way this works is that here you're seeing a hysteresis loop in a sort of three dimensional plot. One axis is a function of magnetic field, and that's the usual, right? So magnetic field couples to these moments, and if you put a positive magnetic field, it will switch, and if you put a negative magnetic field, it'll switch, and there's some barriers, so there's hysteresis. But actually, the sign of the Hall effect will also switch re reversibly and irreversibly as a function of the applied gate voltages. And it turns out that this comes from the fact that in these orbital magnets, you have a uh, a moment which can actually change sign as a function of which uh, which states are occupied. And in particular, the edge states of these quantized anomalous Hall systems have a large moment which can reverse the sign of all of the net moment uh, of all the occupied band electrons. So purely using a gate, you can not just turn the magnetism on and off, say polarized to unpolarized, but you can actually reverse the sign of the magnetic moments and therefore then the equilibrium occupation of the valleys and therefore the Hall effect. So just to show you kind of, you know, uh, 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 the world's most expensive uh, magnetic bit, you know, we can make a single bit and, uh, and you can reversibly switch it, you know, as a function of magnetic field, you can flip the sign of the Hall up and down, but also as a, as a function of, you know, charging this tiny capacitor effectively with zero, uh, uh, zero power, you can also flip the magnetism um, up and down. So as a final thing, I'll just say, you know, one or two more minutes, um, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a big difference between, you know, what I showed you at the beginning and these perfectly clean uh, hysteresis curves that suggest a single domain and actually twisted bilayer graphene where it's, it's full of Barkhausen noise, right? And we wanted to understand that. So um, the experiment we did is a scanning magnetometry experiment using microscopic squids that you can fabricate on the tip of a tiny quartz pipette, which is a technique that we built up in my lab over the last five or six years. And um, it turns out that, you know, to cut a long, long, long story, uh, an, an experimental saga for us short, um, there is a lot of microscopic structure on submicron scales within twisted bilayer graphene. And um, what, uh, what I want to show you is that we now understand, you know, where this comes from and where that Barkhausen noise come from. So what I'm showing you here is basically images of magnetic domains that you can extract from these Barkhausen jumps and doing minor loops. And then what you can do is in the same sample, you can look at the twist angle using, using a different modality of the squid. You can actually map the area of these moiré unit cells as a function of position. And what's plotted here is actually the gradient in the twist angle. And you can see that the magnetic domains are precisely correlated with where there are large gradients in this twist angle. In other words, where the moiré changes, which is exactly the origin of Barkhausen noise, you know, as Barkhausen measured it, right? There are grains and those grains pin magnetic domain walls. Here, in a sense, there are grains, even though it's all one material, actually the strain in this, um, 
uh, that is an intrinsic property of the fact that these are not structural ground states uh, pins these magnetic domains. So, you know, more recently, um, we've been looking at some new materials, you know, one, you know, one would like things that are structurally stable. So the, you know, the metastable things can be good. Um, uh, unstable things we've seen in twisted bilayer, that's fundamentally not a structurally stable st structure. Uh, there was a beautiful discovery recently by Kin Fai Mack and, and Ji Shan's group of another quantized anomal anomalous Hall effect now in a hetero bilayer. So these are two different types of um, transition metal calcogenides that you can stack on top of each other, but because they have different lattice uh, constants, you generate the same sort of moiré physics even at zero angle. And we've been looking at imaging of that. And um, I'll just show you sort of a video. This is as a function of gate voltage of the magnetic moment uh, in, these, uh, in these structures. And oops, uh, where is it? There it is. Um, and you know, if you look at this length scale, this is a 10 micron sample. So they're actually compared to twisted bilayer, very large regions, which are, um, uh, which are uniform, but it's still, you know, there are these big holes in it. We don't know where those come from, probably from some kind of chemistry of, uh, of some of these more air sensitive materials. So that's sort of the direction that we're going. So the very last thing I'll say is that I, I didn't get a chance. It's a sort of a different talk to talk about superconductivity, but it's a, certainly an interesting topic. Um, you know, in twisted bilayer graphene, it, you know, was as just as an update, it, it was originally found to occur near some of these, you know, uh, insulating type states, and it was thought to be some kind of doped mod insulator. But at this point, it's become totally ubiquitous, right? And uh, it's it's rather remarkable that, you know, it, in some ways, <coughs> this field really is emulating the coup rates in that um, some years later, still nobody can really agree about the fundamental mechanism. And I certainly don't really understand um, uh, whether uh, this proximity between all of these types of orbital magnets seem to always come with superconductivity nearby, but whether that's a cooperative phenomenon or uh, are, or their competing um, ground states at this point, I would say is still a matter of a difference of opinion, but um, I'm happy to discuss it, but it, in some ways it's another talk. So let me uh, just acknowledge uh, the people who did the work, um, in particular, uh, Haushin, who uh, did all of the work on uh, crystalline systems that I showed, and Gregory Polshin and Charlie Shearhart and Marek Serlin, um, who uh, led the work on uh, twisted bilayer that I discussed. So thank you all for your attention. Yeah, thank you so much, Andrew. That was a great talk. Um, a lot actually you covered. Uh, so I will open. <laughs> Sorry. <for> yeah. <laughs> no worries. So I will open uh, for questions, I guess, uh, from others, from the audience. And uh, I have a couple of questions, but I can always ask Andrew. Sure. I can ask a question if nobody but comes in. Great, great talk, wonderful data. Uh, I was I, a couple of things. I wondered if you learned something from from the temperature dependence. In, in other words, you had these magnetic phases. Can you learn something about the interact? I gather most of the data you showed was millikelvin data. Um, not not entirely, actually. So yeah, I. I... For the sake of brevity, I didn't want to get into um, energy scales, but yes, there's something that, uh, interesting that you learn, for example, just focusing on quantum anomalous Hall um, in, uh, in these doped, magnetically doped topological insulator systems. You know, the Curie temperature is 15 or 20 Kelvin, and the quantum anomalous Hall temperature is, you know, gap is millikelvin, or maybe it's a Kelvin. There's sort of at least an order of magnitude difference. In these intrinsic systems, the Curie temperature is seven Kelvin and the quantum anomalous Hall gap is 30 Kelvin. So, and that's actually quite a bit, quite in line with, um, with uh, you know, theoretical modeling that was done subsequently. So it, it more or less, indeed, those energy scales really sort of line up with what, you know, people think the intrinsic energy scales should be essentially in a disorder-free system. And that's very encouraging, right? It also means though that we can't like improve it and have it go higher. You need to find new material, right? We're, we're already yeah, not a, at the intrinsic limit. Yeah. Right. Yes, yes, thank you. Sure. Any other question? Let's see. Yeah, well, I have another question. <laughs> sure, sure. Bring it on. Yeah. So I wondered about anisotropies. I mean, you showed that these systems are anisotropic because you have hysteresis and so on. Uh, what what is setting the scale of the anisotropy? Is that I mean obviously you have these two dimensional layers, so you have a set of it, you know for the orbitals it's essentially 
they are just icing spins. There's not really a sense in which they, uh, you know, uh, those orbital, I mean, those orbital moments can just point in plane by doing a superposition, but the, the moments can't actually be uh, pointing in plane. They, they really are just two-dimensional orbits and, and there are no orbits out of, out of the plane. So that, yeah, that, that, that's more or less what I would say. So it's some kind, I mean, so there's some kind of spin orbit coupling effectively that sets that. Well, it's not a spin. It's really just an orbit. So it's just that, I mean, that's maybe the, I could have emphasized more, but you know, the moments that are polarized in almost every situation are not, I'm not, it's not clear whether the spins are polarized at all, or, you know, in some ways, all of this physics would be the same if the spins were fully polarized all the time, it wouldn't affect anything else. There's, because there's no spin orbit coupling, spin is, it's only in the problem kind of indirectly. Um, and uh, the mm -hmm. moments that we measure, for example, are, really the moments of these, you know, at some microscopic scale, real space orbits. I see. Well, so with, the, with magnetic field, you can flip them, right? You, you can, can, yeah, they'll couple to a magnetic field. They are an orbital moment. Yeah. So that gives you, that will mean that there is some anisotropy. In, in, in that you can, absolutely, so, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I guess it becomes- But you can never make them point in plane, right? You can never make an individual one point in plane. You can't measure sort of a hard axis loop in some sense of this. Uh, you could probably, uh, Pull them. Yeah, I, I think if you had an individual one, if you had a unit cell of graphene, then you could not put that moment in plane. Uh, you know, ten thousand Tesla or something. Okay, huge fields then. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, any other question? Uh, I can ask one. I guess if there is no other question. Um, so I guess you know adding superconductivity to this business, right? Uh, I guess for quantum anomalous Hall effect, people try to make Josephson junction, right? And then it's insulating, so you just can't really like proximitize things. It still is 25 kilo ohm, but somehow it doesn't work. Is this better? Um... You know, I, you know, I, I'm a little bit of a skeptic of the proximitizing uh, things. I think it just seems so hard. I mean, I don't have to tell you, right? <laughs> like, right. I think it's hard to do. Um, right. I think there's an opportunity because mm -hmm. you have superconductivity in these topological states in the same system. I, you know, I probably wouldn't bet on it. No, but, no, let me, let me I guess, yeah. tone it down. If you go to the anomalous data, that's, that's beautiful. Like you have really good quantization. So what if you just put aluminum or something and then say, I have one mode, can I get supercurrent? Um, yeah, I, I think, I think that, okay. So, you know, functionally, what are the problems? Um, in twisted bilayer graphene, just reproducibility has been a disaster, right? I mean, you know, the, you make a hundred samples and one of them looks like this and you make another 200 sample to get another one that looks even remotely like it. So there's just a barrier to engineering there. Um, I think these TMD systems, uh, this, uh, you know, Molly Telluride, tungsten selenide, and there, I'm sure there will be other instances of, of that class seem more promising um, because they are much more reproducible probably because they're hetero bilayers. And so you're not as susceptible to all these small perturbations. Um, I, you know, they're a little challenging because they're air sensitive. They're a little challenging to contact in general, but I think it's actually promising because it, not, there's actually a thing I didn't talk about. There's quantum, quantum anomalous hall, but there's also ec amazing quantum spin hall um, mm -hmm. in the same system. So I, I think, yeah, I think there there's potential for trying to do that type of Majorana physics. Got it, got it. Okay, awesome. Awesome. Um, any other question? I guess if not, uh, we can slowly wrap up. Okay. I guess we thank you, Andrea, and we hopefully see you soon. <laughs> Thanks, Shavad. Yeah, and I'll, 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 I'm happy to, to swing by in, in uh, March Absolutely. and meet, meet with anybody who's interested. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you All so right. much. Bye, everybody. Yeah. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thanks thank listening. you. Yeah. Thanks.